on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. Readers don't care. They just want to be transported. What they need is the one detail that you glean from your research that will make your story come alive. You don't have to prove to the reader that you went to Lisbon for this book or that you looked at, a, at an autopsy. We believe you. Just make us happy with a good story. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello, yes, welcome back to The Self-Publishing Show. This is episode two of three from New York City where Tom, I, and John Dyer have spent the week at Thriller Fest. Tom Ashford standing in for Mark Dawson on a well-earned break. Tom, how was your first episode? Pretty good. He's a man of few words, is Tom, which uh, I've got got to be honest, isn't the ideal quality for somebody presenting the podcast, but... No, it's been great. Oh, okay, excellent. Yeah. That was three I'm more words. More. I'm more. <laughs> we might go up the World Trade Center later. He's written nine novels. How many words have you written? Oh, about four between them. <laughs> no, probably about 600,000 600, words. 600,000 So I've written short. half that. Yeah. And I've only, I've only got zero novels. Yeah, exa- well, yeah. Exa- that's... Does make any sense at all? <laughs> makes no sense. Okay, look, we are still in Dumbo. You can see the Brooklyn Bridge behind us and bits of Manhattan. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, a new product we've been briefed about this week. So we had lunch on one of the days this week, I can't remember which day, with Published Drive, with Phyllis from Published Drive, who works here. And we've had Kinga Yanetashish, uh, I think I can say that, genetics, uh, are here on the uh, podcast in the past. Now, they, Kinker told us a little while ago that within their dashboard on Published Drive, which is an aggregating service that will put your book up to uh, all the various retailers, uh, that they had a split royalties option. So if two of us, for instance, if you and I, Tom, the, you know, the dream team, Ashford yeah. and Blatch, wrote a novel together and we split the royalties 60-40 in favour of me, if we did that, always be negotiating, uh, then Publish Drive would do all the maths for you and your report at the end of the month would show you the royalty split after expenses and so on. And that's really useful. In fact, it's particularly useful for those growing number of indie authors who are publishing other people's books, those little indie imprints to do those split royalties. Well, it's been so successful embedded into Publish Drive, they've extricated it and they've extended it to cover Amazon and Kindle Unlimited. Uh, it is called Abacus, it's a standalone product, it's just been launched, we were briefed on it just ahead of its uh, uh, official announcement. And uh, if you want to try it out, I think there's a month at the moment for free, that might just be running out, that beta period. After that it's going to be $2.99 per book per month. Uh, but like I say, if you're running a small imprint that could be useful. We're going to put the link to Abacus and Publish Drive in the show notes. Uh, so you can get them there on the website. Right, let's move on to today's interviews, this episode's interviews. As I said, we've been here at Thriller Fest, we've been listening to all the craft sessions from fantastic, well-renowned, world-selling, best-selling authors who've imparted their knowledge to us. And you don't have to come to New York if you don't want to to watch Thriller Fest. You can just watch these three episodes and we've pulled out these 10 to 12 minute interviews with each of these protagonists. And we are now going to talk to Lisa Unger, uh, who had the rather vague title of How to Write a Novel. I mean, that was literally the title of her That's session, it. wasn't no it? No clues at all. <laughs> but she's somebody who knows how to write novels. She's got fantastic success behind her. Uh, many of you will be familiar with Lisa Unger's work. Uh, and as I mentioned at the end of the last episode, a lot of this stuff pertains to you as an author of whatever genre you write. It's not just uh, about thriller authors. And Lisa, actually, of course, it turned out to be quite detailed and good advice. So let's hear from Lisa. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Um, yeah, I'm Lisa Unger, and I am the New York Times best-selling novelist of 17 novels of psychological su- suspense, including The Stranger Inside, which comes out this September. Super. We've had excellent success, which is uh, amazing. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It's always exciting and inspiring. Thank you. And you led a session yesterday. Quite a lot of the session titles are fairly niche. Yeah. Your session was how to write a novel. Right, which could could hardly be looser, right? Could hardly yeah. be more broad because, you know, is there one way to write a novel? No, there is not one way to write a novel. I mean, there are probably as many different ways to write a novel as there are, you know, uh, writers. But, you know, there are some basic 
concepts that you know I kind of went over in my talk. One of the you know one thing is that obviously we all start with an idea. Um, for me, that idea can come from anywhere. It might be a line of poetry or a news story or in one case even a piece of junk mail. And then usually if I get that like sort of excitement or this like buzzy feeling that I get, it leads me to like a sloth of research. Um, so we talked a little bit about research in that class and how important it is um, to all your you know, subject matter, what you know and then what you come to know through your research. And then for me, the best way I can describe it is if it connects with something larger that's going on with me, then I start to hear voices. And it's these voices, um, might be one voice speaking like a very intimate first person voice, it might be multiple voices, and these voices lead me through my narrative. So when you say speaks to something large, you're talking about a thematically or like emotionally? Or? Maybe psychologically, neurologically, spiritually, like whatever it is, like that's the only way I can explain like the level of intensity that is required to write a novel. Like is, it's a very organic and personal process for me. So I have to be deeply engaged, not just with my subject matter, but also with my voices, with the characters living in my head. So we talked a little bit about that in my talk, and then um, we talked about how at this point a lot of people have to kind of make that big decision about whether they're the outliner or the, I know they call it panther, it's a horrible word, which is a horrible word. Yeah. It, does, it completely does not describe the essence of the people who write the way I we write. We need to come up with a new expression. I know. The, the dynamic writer somebody or Somebody said yeah. like a dynamic writer. I like that. Orga yeah. Organic, organic writer. Yeah, organic mm. writer. I like that. I think we'll go with that. Yeah, let's go with that. So organic. when you have that organic process, you know, I follow those voices through the narrative and I don't know what what's going to happen day to day. That is your process. It is. Yeah. I okay. don't know what's going to, I don't know who's going to show up. I don't know what they're going to do. Um, but uh, I, I have written 17 novels by following my voices through the narrative and like sort of my, all my plots flow from character. How, f so ju just on your process then, Lisa, your, you get to the end of that first draft. Yes. How did you work forward through it or do you go back and revise? I'm, I'm pretty linear, you know, because I am following voices. So I feel like in a lot of ways I'm, I'm writing for the same reason that I read because I want to know what's going to happen. So the novel does build on itself that way. And usually by the time I'm at a first draft, at the end of a first draft, um, which generally takes about nine to 12 months, and it might be, um, you know, maybe 100,000 words or a little bit more at that time, um, usually it's about 95% there oh, really? structurally wow. structurally considering, yeah. <laughs> you, considering you've worked Consid in a linear sense exactly. that's amazing yeah, yeah so structurally it's very it's very much there might be some like sort of moving arounds of sequences and stuff like that but generally structurally the bones are are there there's of course another year of editorial work um but there's like that kind of structure um is pretty solid at that point for me um and so that's you know so we've talked about like in my class, I talk about the idea, I talk about research, talk about voices, outlining, and stuff like that. And then I talk about, you know, the actual hard part, which is you just sit down and write your book. And there's no shortcuts there. No. You know? <laughs> At the end of the day, you need to, yeah. as someone said, bum on seat, hands bum on, on seat. keyboard. Exactly. You know, there's no, no... Nose to the keyboard. Right. Exactly. And is there a way that you, um, you make sure that you're doing that? Do you have a routine or do you advise people to find a motivation for that? I absolutely do. Like, I think that what I tell aspiring writers, because always the thing that you hear is like, oh, I really want to write, but... I just don't have the time. And I had a creative writing teacher who I heard speak one time and she said, hey, you know what? If you're not creative enough to find the time to write, then you're not creative enough to write. And that's pretty harsh, but there is a kernel of truth to that. So the number one thing I tell all, you know, all aspiring writers is that you need to schedule the time to write as you would schedule anything that's important to you. And then you honor the schedule. And it's really, you know, it really is that simple. It's just not easy, right? Yeah, yeah. So for me, I mean, my golden creative hours are 5 a.m. to noon. Like that's, you know, where I am like at my most creative, my most high energy. So generally, you know, for me, I'm trying to get to the keyboard as early as possible. 5 a.m. is ideal. 
course, I'm a mom and I have a house and a home and a husband and a daughter. And as long as nobody was like up at 4 a.m. puking for some unknown reason, that's like what any I Any one of for. those three could have been. Any, yeah. It could have been yeah. anyone, right? The dog, right, exactly. Oh, yeah, Especially yeah. the dog. It's yeah. more than the dog. We have a similar situation, <laughs> Luckily, yeah. Luckily, right? Yeah. 4 a.m. is the witching hour for the dog, apparently. Right. And um, yeah, so you, I get to try to get to my desk by, by 5 a.m. I try to get that first creative cycle between 5 and 7. And then my daughter gets up and I get her ready for school and either I or my husband will take her to school and then I'm back at my desk by 8.15. And then that second creative block will be about 8.15 to 12.15. So that's a solid four hour creative block. Um, and that's a really important one. That's like a super important one. And then um, I generally break in the middle of the day where I'll eat and then exercise because exercise is a big part of my process. It's where a lot of stuff like sort of gestates and then it or like comes to like you know there's like these kind of bursts of ideas and narrative problems fixed or whatever and then i try to get one more creative cycle in before my daughter gets home from school and then i batch the shallow work which is a phrase from a book called deep work by cal newport i batch the shallow work in the afternoon email social media you know all the stuff that's like the business of being a writer so that's kind of how I do, that's the ideal schedule. That's like yeah. the golden, yeah. And I think there's going to be slight variations of, of that course. work for different people. Well, and, and um, some people are like, you know, don't, you know, they're not early birds and they're never yeah. going to be early birds and their golden creative hours might be from midnight to 3 a.m. Yeah. And it's like, I think that the most important thing to take away from that is to find those hours in your life that nobody else wants. Nobody else wants the hours, for example, of four to six a.m. Nobody wants that. Not even your children, hopefully, want those hours. The dog, Sometimes maybe. The dog might, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's always. I get, the, the, I get the feeling so the dog's quite needy at that so, time. He's very needy. Yeah, yeah, he's always the wild card. And then uh, my daughter is like not needy at all. She's like all herself, but the dog is like still like yeah. he's like a perpetual clingy, clingy baby. Dog. Yeah, yeah, very clingy. <laughs> And um, yeah, and so like find those hours that are just yours, you know, and then be, you have to, but you have to make a commitment to that time. And you have to think of it as if you've made a commitment to your friend or you've made an appointment with yeah. a personal trainer Take it seriously. or whatever. You, you wouldn't let your friend down. You wouldn't miss an appointment that you made. Why are you letting yourself down? Why are you missing an appointment that you made with yourself? And then when you find that block of time and you have it, and you're sitting down at your keyboard, and instead of doing the, the focus work of writing, you find yourself on Facebook, you know, watching cat videos or, you know, whatever it is people do on the internet now, like take a quiz to find out what your spirit animal is, uh -huh. whatever. If stuff. you find yourself doing that, then the simple truth is that you just didn't care enough to write your book. And it's all about that. It's all about writing. It's all about the writing. It's all about the words on the page. And it never ever stops being about that. Even after, you know, I published 17 novels, um, a lot, I think a lot of people think of that, oh, I'm gonna get this first book publishing contract and it's gonna be, um, you know, like a windfall, right? It's gonna be like, you know, it's the end of the journey. But to be honest, it's only the beginning. It's just an open door to the writing life. And the most important thing never, it never stops being the words on the page that you wrote the best book that you could write every single time. Yeah. Do you say it's just on a practical level? Do you set yourself word count targets for the day? Or is it I really don't. I'm at least a thousand words. I, for me, it's more about, you know, I know a lot of people like I'm putting those words down no matter what. Um, and I can always fix it later. I don't necessarily prescribe to that, but I will say is that, you know, there's, you know, there are these days where, you know, you're just, alive with it right and the inspiration is high and like you can't keep those pages from coming you know and then there are the days where you're really leaning on your craft like I'm a professional writer I've been writing professionally for 20 years I was a writer long long before that so I sit down and write whether inspiration is high or not but I'm not going to just put words down onto sure. the page you wait for that organic moment where you see your way to the next thing and that's not always linear that's not always the same amount of pages every day but it's like basically it's knowing that you you're available during that time and you make a time where your brain is available for the story and you'll be amazed at how often inspiration meets you there yeah. you know it's like sort of this union between like the magical element of it and just the discipline of being a working creative so that's um you know something i think everybody can sort of benefit from 
thinking about. Be there, be there at the time, be available, schedule the time, honor the schedule, be there, even if the inspiration is not there, and maybe it'll meet you there. Honor thyself. Exactly. Yeah, I do remember, yeah. there's, I don't know who said it once, but there's no such thing as writer's block, there's just not writing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And a little tip we got from J.D. Barker uh, in an interview last year, which I took on, and as often as I do, it works really well, is when you stop your session of writing, stop at a point where you're really enjoying it. Yeah. It's yeah. such a small thing, but... It is. Because if you've got to the end of a, a chapter and you know your next thing is a beginning, yeah. it can be a bit off-putting to even right. start. Right, stop in the middle. I've heard people say stop in the middle of a sentence, stop yeah. in the middle of a page, in the middle of a chapter. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. For me, that, that makes such a lot a, of sense. Such a good tip. Yeah. Okay, Lisa. Yeah. Do you know what? That was brilliant. We are going to have to get you on, I think, for a full kind of 30, 40 minute Absolutely. I, about this. I would love it. I would love it. But yeah. This has been a, a, a taste of the, uh, <laughs> the Lisa Ung uh, system of uh, getting yeah, shit done. Exactly. Get it done. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Brilliant. Sure. So thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Well, there you go. That's Lisa Unger. I really, really enjoyed Lisa's interview. I thought she was fantastic. I thought she was very SPF, you know, the sort of person that we love uh, on the self-publishing show who talks very clearly about, you know, no, no mincing her words about you've got to get the work done and here are some ideas to modify your routines to make sure you get the words done. Uh, and actually, Lisa's based down in Florida uh, near St. Pete where we're going to go for Nink in a couple of months. So we've promised to bring our cameras down there and spend maybe 30, 40 minutes with Lisa and do a full, uh, full podcast episode with her because I think that'd be really worthwhile. Uh, Tom, do you have a particular routine for writing? Yeah, so um, obviously I work with you guys with SPF, so if I, uh, I, prioritize, I prioritize that in the way that someone might prioritize sort of like a day job, a regular job. Um, He's just then, saying that for us, yeah, but you yeah, carry I, on. I get yeah. a two hours of work done yeah. in a day. Uh, and then after that, I just work until until dinner usually, and then um, that might be two and a half, three hours or something maybe, solid. Yeah. And then after dinner, if I'm still sort of like feeling fresh, I'll carry on writing, and if I'm not, then I'll just that's my chilling out time. Yeah. To recharge. I think I need to. Find, I've been pretty good at writing. Certainly got my words done. But um, I don't have a particular routine. I like the way Lisa talks. I need to probably uh, work something out that's going to work well for me. Uh, maybe new when the book's published and the next one's being drafted, I'll come in with the... Uh... 2030. Rude. Okay, now we're going to talk about TV. Uh, we're going to talk about TV and film from two perspectives. First of all, we're going to hear from John Land, who's going to talk to you about getting into the industry, about what it is uh, you need to do as a novel writer to eventually see your book uh, on TV or in film. And he's got some practical, really good, easy tips for that, and also some realism thrown in there about what the industry is like. Then we're going to hear directly after John from Lee Goldberg. Now, Lee is somebody who knows TV inside out. He's the guy who writes episodes of Diagnosis Murder. And if you're in the UK, you'll be intimately familiar with Diagnosis Murder because it's on, frankly, every lunchtime. I mean, it's been on TV, I think, more or less every day of my lifetime. Uh, it's Dick Van Dyke, is it? Yeah. Unbelievable, it. Dick Van Dyke. Uh, so Lee has written episodes for that. He's written episodes for lots of uh, TV shows that you will have watched in the past. Uh, he's a really great guy and he talks not about how to get into TV. He's left that behind now and moved on. He talks about the techniques that you use in television uh, to grip your audience, to keep things ticking over for them and embedding those and learning from that and using those in your novel writing. So Lee's coming second, but first let's hear from uh, the irrepressible John Land. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. John, here we are again. We are, an annual tradition. I have to say, I heard you coming. Uh huh. I heard you coming as okay. you emerged from the door. We know, we know John Land is in the building. We can hear the conversation. Yeah, and my ego hits you before, my, uh, before, our, before we, our eyes meet. But we love it. There's never a dull moment. Uh -huh. And you've had a session this morning already, and we want to I talk did. to you about Hollywood, I think. Okay. So you've been setting out this idea, a quote I think you just uh, told us about, that Hollywood wants the same thing but different. And that Give me was, the same thing, only different. Okay, that was kind of the thesis. Yes. So, so how, do we, how do we do that? Well, it's kind of like Christmas morning. Everything's all wrapped up, but the packages are... They, the gifts all look different, even if they're the, pretty much the same, because the, the, the way they're packaged. And I think what, you, what you're doing with a film... Um, depending on the genre. If it's a haunted house movie, 
We had Jaws. Then we had Jaws in Space, which was alien. You know, you have Jaws underwater. You know, Die Hard. Die Hard on a plane. Die Hard in a building. Die Hard in a building. Die Hard in a train. Die Hard in a boat. You know, uh, Die Hard in New York City. So it's a matter of finding a new backdrop. It's, it's coming up with something that works so that when you give them something that wor- that, that's comfortable, you're giving them a nice a package that they feel they want to open because it's, it's familiar to them. And yet, it's different enough to make them think that they're doing something for the first time. Yeah, and that is a balance, isn't it? And this goes, I think, to, to everything really, to choosing your genre, et cetera, is that it's a mistake to try and do something different because there's a reason why people are doing the same thing, but it's also a mistake to just do a copy. You, there has to be... It, what's amazing about Hollywood is that no matter what you give them, they tell you they've already got it. Yeah. And, or they've already done it. So what it becomes is finding someone who wants to do what you have. It's all timing. It's, it's all timing. But it's also the thing about what, what the, the doorway into Hollywood today through all the low budget films that are happening. Also, there are 500 scripted series on the air right now. And there are going to be more because of what Apple has just announced, that they're getting into it. So if you, this is the great time to be a writer if you're able to package what you do into a format. I'll give you an example. Bob Kosberg is the master of pitching. He once went, walked into a room of producers and sold a movie with three words, Jaws with Paws. It was Jaws with a dog. It was a terrible movie, but it got made. He got paid. It got sold. It's so the ultimate high concept. It's the ultimate high concept, and this is the thing. The same thing, only different, means something you can sell the movie on. If you can't summarize it in an elevator yeah. on the, and the, from floor one to floor 20, then there's something wrong, because what are you going to... You need to be able to say what your movie is about, which means it has to feel familiar, but also be an original take on something that is familiar. It's kind of like the same Armani suit as last year, only a different color, but it's still an Armani suit. So it's still the same. So Hollywood still requires you to distill your message down to a sentence that's going to grip them at the beginning. There's no no sort of level of sophistication now where you can submit a a treatment for them to read through. It's even more true now than ever. Why? because the bulk of films that are sold are not sold to theaters. They're sold direct to video or streaming sites. So when you're looking through those 30 movies that got released this week on video on demand, 50 movies, 100 movies, you, what are you looking at? To get you to read the, to watch yeah, the preview, you're out. looking at the quick, what that one sentence thing is. You know, and you try to catch those key words that make you feel. And, and that's the other thing. You, when you create a pitch, an elevator pitch, you want it to mean something emotionally. It's very challenging to do, but it's very important. Because you, if you emotionally vest whoever's looking at your concept, and this is the whole point of the high concept. Jaws was the ultimate high concept. A killer shark yeah. terrorizes a summer-based community. I mean, there you go. Right there, you know you have a winner if nothing else happens. But when you say, police chief who's afraid of the water tracks a killer shark terrorizing his community, you take it to another level. So that's the same thing, only different, because you've given it that other take. That that humor thing, obviously, that's always been an important thing for Hollywood. And I think another good example is Terminator, where you have... The, the robot coming back from the future to destroy somebody who's going to do great damage. But the key is the mother protecting her son. Once you throw that element into it, that's, the, that's when you that's really know the story. That's exactly right. A Terminator coming back to prevent, uh, to, to, to kill the person who's going to stop his creation is not as good as a, ter- a mother fights to protect a boy, her son yeah. from a killer robot sent back from the future to kill him. Yeah. To prevent... That's so, when you immediately want to know what happens next. Because now you've, in, you've made the viewer, the reader, in the, who's cho- wondering whether he should choose or she should choose your movie, 
you've invested them emotionally in what is going to happen. You have, so that's what dresses up. That's the bow on the wrapping. Let's go back to the Christmas package metaphor. That's the bow on the wrapping. Why do we care? What makes us emotionally vested in the story? Should writers be chasing Hollywood or should they just be doing their job as writers? Doing their job as writers is chasing Hollywood. The question is, what do you? Ch how how much do you invest in your chase? How much? It's it's a, it's, a, it's a brilliant question, and here's why. Writing a script is one thing, but then you get a producer who loves the script and wants to work with you, and says, "I just need you to do a little punch up." Fifty drafts later, <laughs> you're still doing punch ups. There's no money. Yet. You're chasing. You're chasing, and you have to decide as a writer, do you have the time, the energy, and the motivation? Is this worth chasing to the point where it may never happen? And that's the frustration. It's, it's one thing to do rewrites after your script has been bought and you've been paid. It's a whole other thing to do the rewrites as part of the creative process, even sometimes when you don't believe in what you're being asked to do. You don't agree necessarily. You're being told something. So the producer is trying to do what's best for the producer um, and what he, what he or she thinks they can best package. But that doesn't mean they're right. So it's a decision each writer has to make in their own, you know, it's, it, it, in their own artistic integrity and in the, in the integrity of their own project. Um, if somebody doesn't get something, they're the wrong person for, for producing it. You know, the, 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 one of my favorite movies is The Usual Suspects, mm -hmm. classic film. It was made independently because they couldn't raise the money. Nobody understood what the movie was about. One of the execs who actually wanted to make it, who wanted to buy it, said to Brian Singer, I will make this movie tomorrow. I love everything about it. I'm a big crime fan, I'm a big noir fan. Just do one thing for me, one note. Verbal Kent can't be Kaiser Sose. Kevin Spacey can't be Kaiser Sose. That's the movie. Yeah. And this guy said, just change this one little thing. <laughs> and I'll buy the script. The one thing everyone remembers from the film. The one thing that made the film. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, so this is the, the very de definition of chasing is making changes that you know are wrong and that are going to kill the chances. Yeah. But the most important rule to go by in contrast to that is get the movie made. You, unlike the book business, which is more... They, they fall in love with the integrity of your idea and they want to make it better. In for the film business, it, it, there are so many levels that have to be passed. You could have written the best story ever about a 21-year-old girl coming into her own, but if they cast a 35 or a 45-year-old actress, now you have to go back and write the movie to that, dem to that demographic, to that actress, because that's who, you got, that's who got the movie made. You didn't get the movie made. That actress got the movie made. So... The chasing, it's fun to chase when your movie's getting made and it's just a question of um, how it gets made. The key thing is to be a team player. The key thing is you as the writer, if they come to you and say, we've bought your script, we've paid you, but now we have to make changes because this is the actor we really want. This will get the movie made. Do you say, no, I'm not going to do that? Of course not. You say, just tell me what you need. He, my, this is my philosophy. The answer is yes. What was the question? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be soul destroying for some people, though. And I guess that's what you were alluding to earlier. You've got to work out whether this is for you. You have to determine how much you're willing to compromise. That's what art, art is at the, at, the, at the pop culture level. It's a compromise. But... It's like the old, the, the, you know, a tree fell in the forest, no one heard or saw it fall. Did it really fall? Well, you wrote a book, you wrote a movie, but nobody ever read it, nobody ever saw it. Did you really write it? No. You don't exist in a vacuum. You write books so people will read them. You write, you write movies so people will watch them and they'll get made. So the question isn't, will you do it? It's, I will not only do it, I'll make it better. I'll make this a bit, it might not be exactly where we started, but it's not the destination for the writer, it's the journey. So having an enthusiasm for having the project made, even if that... That is, trumps the material. Yeah, so maybe think of it as a surprising route to go down rather than a route that you didn't want to happen. Just think, okay, it's a challenge to you as a writer. Exactly. You know, and this is the... Th it's a, exactly. 
it's like Churchill said, where some people see a challenge, I see an opportunity. So you look at it as an opportunity. And the other thing is, if you don't do it, they're just going to bring somebody else in who does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just going to fire you. They paid you. And now they're going to, you know, I want the opportunity to take my stuff over the finish line. Because what happens when other writers come in is, when they make changes that seem major, but really don't, aren't necessarily emo, you just have to find another definition. You have to find another way. It's, it's putting another bow on the wrapping. It's putting another bow on the box. That's all it is. The wrapping is still there. It's still a present on Christmas morning. Now, for a lot of the people who attend this conference, they will just be novelists at the moment, um, starting out or maybe a couple under their belt. Everyone loves the idea, I would say everyone, I think most of us love the idea that one of our books would some, at some point be adapted. Do we think about Hollywood, even in a kind of abstract way, when you're sitting down plotting your next book, do you think about Hollywood at that stage? That's a great point. The answer is no, but here's the thing. If you write a great story, you are thinking about Hollywood. Because what, what film business is looking for are great stories. If you write a great story, that maximizes your ability to sell to Hollywood. There's a reason why they say they adapt books. They don't make books into movies, they adapt them into movies. So if they find something in yours that they like. Example, one of the scariest, best horror stories I've ever read was Nosferatu by Joe Hill, Stephen King's son. It's being done on AMC right now. It's being done brilliantly. In the book, she was a little girl and then she was a mother who had a son about the age she was. In the TV production, she's 18 years old. She was never that. In the book, they totally changed the nature of her character, but they didn't change the story yeah. or the challenges her character was facing. They redefined them. It was a different wrapping on the same box, in other words. There's a perfect example. So not only did they not do the little girl, not only did they have they not done the, the, the grown-up woman with a child of her own being threatened by this devilish character, they invented an entirely new take on the same girl. They started basically with the skeleton and they put the flesh around it. So when you're writing a book that, if you're lucky enough to have adapted, you're selling them a skeleton and you're giving away, you're basically saying, you're gonna, you're gonna, I'm going to accept the fact you're going to take the flesh off my bones. Yeah. And sometimes that's a great metaphor for what it feels like. Yeah. But if you're lucky enough to be in that situation, don't complain. There's a great line in The Godfather 2, Hyman Roth to Michael Corleone. Michael, this is the business we have chosen. This is part of it. It's, this is part of being a professional. Yeah. It, it, being a professional is a person who's willing to compromise what they think is right in favor of, more, of attaining a greater good. And if it means, some people will say, no, I won't do that. I don't care if it gets made or not. I'm not like that. I'll do anything they tell me if it helps get my movie made. And let's not be afraid of the fact this is a business. It's and you, a business. You're a writer, but you're also a business And it's person. a challenge for, it's, to the creative mind. Yeah. It, it's kind of like if you're an interior designer you, and you have this great image for what you want to do for somebody's house and they hate it. Well, what do you do? You just give them their money back? No, you come up with another idea. You come up with another notion. You listen to what they didn't like the first time and you give them what they want. Give me the same thing, only different. Finally, John, for people who just have a wishful dream about maybe getting a book uh -huh. adapted or, or making those first steps, have you got any advice for them about, is it still a contacts game? Is it who you know? Or is it something, a complete... Well, well it's two things. Okay. The first thing is you've got to have a script or a, you have to have something to sell. More than a, more than a novel. You've got to have a, I, I a think, treatment. I or... think an original script will get... Novels tend to be more expensive mm -hmm. to adapt. If, they don't, if, they don't, if they're not bestsellers, people will say, well, nobody bought it. What do we want to make it for? But if you have an original script, you're getting evaluated on your own merits. So, you do, so the question of how best to break in is not to write a great book. The best way to break into Hollywood is to write a great script. That get, opens doors for you that a book won't open. Because anybody out there can read a script. Nobody out there reads books. Now, they'll read the coverage of it. They'll read the summary of it. And they'll look at the sales figures. So the best way is have your, instead of giving someone a business card, have a script to hand them. Have a script that is high concept, we talked about that, that gives them what they want, only different, that is comparable to other project movies that have worked in the past, that they understand how they can sell it, how they can package it, and what they can compare it to, how they can attract talent to it. Um, 
you know, and I think too, actors want to be challenged, but they want to win awards. They want to be lauded. So if you write great roles, or you know, you could also, if you're writing a book, you could write a screenplay version of your own book because you own the intellectual property already. Yeah. So that's also a possibility, but it's apples and oranges. A book, what works in a book doesn't necessarily work in a screenplay. A book, adapting a 400 page book would be a seven hour movie. You've got to cut that to two hours unless you want to do a TV show, which is a whole nother thing. You know, that's, a, that's much more of a closed world. You know, you need showrunners and everything. But the most important thing is to write a great story. You do that, you're going to have a shot. Yeah. John, it's always a great pleasure to This was fun. We, talk, we didn't talk about this last year. This was fun. No, this was good. Well, this is value. People listening to this. Next go. year, we'll talk about all the film stuff I've got going that, I, that came that from now to then. We'll see what we can do. It would be the practical demonstration of what you've talked about this Thank time next you, year. Absolutely. Yes. We'll, we'll put my money where my mouth is. And that's a lot of money because I got a big mouth. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Lee. Yes. Goldberg. Thank you so much indeed. I've been trying to, to avoid you guys, <laughs> yeah, but you stalked me. You we, chased uh, me down. We almost rugby tackled you <laughs> to, uh, to get you here. Now, um, the title of your session that you did yesterday, Caught Our Eye, for using TV techniques uh -huh. to supercharge your novel. And I think it's very zeitgeist because the, it feels to me there's never been a closer crossover between novel reading, writing, and watching TV. Well, it's almost the same thing. People are so trained for stories to move the way they move on film. They have that same pace, that same economy of exposition. And if you can use those same techniques in your thrillers, they'll be thrilling. Yeah. But, you know, so many thrillers begin with pages of boring exposition. They don't remember that a thriller is supposed to thrill. So if you use TV and film screenwriting techniques, it really jacks up the, the storytelling. And this means that we have to start looking at TV in a slightly more critical way because it's easy to watch things and not really notice how they're put together. But would you advise writers well, think about how they're put together? Writers, I should, let me take it back. Viewers have internalized the structure of a TV show. They expect stories to be told in the three-act structure of a film or a four-act structure of a TV show. And if it's not, it feels like something's lacking. So yes, I would urge novelists, particularly thriller authors, to look at how a TV show or a film is structured, to look at the way they reveal character and story through dialogue and action rather than exposition, and, and adopt those same techniques in their writing. And is this something you think is being adopted by writers, or do you, are you still looking at novelists, particularly newer novelists, who don't, oh, who no, don't get this? No, there's, there's so many novelists who don't get it who just are so in love with their prose, so in love with their descriptions, or they've, they've done this research and they want you to know it. So they just blurt out all this research just so you know that they read a bunch of reference books or they yeah. went to these places. <laughs> Wikipedia. Readers don't care. They just want to be transported. What they need is the one detail that you glean from your research that will make your story come alive. You don't have to prove to the reader that you went to Lisbon for this book or that you looked at, a, at an autopsy. We believe you. Just make us happy with a good story. Okay, so let's get down some nitty detail. What techniques did you impart yesterday to people? To get I said to the this? key to getting ahead is to sleep with your editor or sleep with a producer. Okay. That's, that's the way to do well, it. Well, happily, I'm doing right. both. So, yeah. so what I imparted yesterday was the importance of having a conflict in every single scene. That if a scene doesn't have conflict, if it doesn't reveal character or move the story forward, the scene should go. Okay. And to have as little exposition, meaning explanation and background as possible. Get rid of the boring stuff, as Elmore Leonard would say, yeah. if you he were here. Yes. And he would rather, you'd rather have Elmore Leonard here, let's be honest. Um, yeah, so, and that's good editorial technique anyway for writing, isn't it? Each scene should have a purpose. And, and Not just a purpose, it, it should reveal character. It should have conflict in it. A scene of your hero having breakfast, thinking about the predicament he's in, is not a scene full of conflict that reveals character and moves the story forward. It's treading editorial water. It's, it's wasting time. And so many authors do it because so many authors don't outline. They make up the stories, they go along, so they just want to keep typing. And the problem is they don't go back and cut the crap later because everything they write is gold. Yes. And you have to also be a very good editor. You have to learn to be brutal with your own writing. Kill your babies. You've got to slaughter your babies. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the brevity in TV writing, which is 
shocking and astonishing for most novelists to understand is obviously a key part of why TV well, it's works. It's not so much brevity, brevity, it's that stories are told through action and dialogue. So if people don't say it or do it, it doesn't happen. Whereas in a book, you can do all this stuff inside people's heads and you can blather on and on about a location or a, a fact or a detail. And it's very easy to do because it keeps you typing. But it doesn't really move the story forward. It, it kills the rhythm of the story. It kills the narrative momentum. And in a screenplay, you can't do that. You just simply can't. It's, it's physically impossible because you need everything revealed through dialogue. And if you have dialogue that's this long, full of BS backstory, it's going to get cut. So do you suggest as an approach, Lee, that people, when they set out to outline their novel, they think of it as a film or a TV Yes, series? yes, because in a, in a film, all the facts have to come out through action and dialogue. So if your story can't be revealed through action and dialogue, then who's a problem with your story? That's not to say you can't have a few paragraphs now and then of what's going on in your, in your character's mind or, or, or backstory about a location or, or a procedure, but make it short as short as possible, down to one line if you can. Yeah. So what's your background, Lee? So tell us about your credits. I started as a male model and then a professional escort yeah. and, uh, and is that when you started sleep, sleeping with um, your editor? <laughs> I, I started as a journalist, writing about the entertainment industry for Newsweek, Los Angeles Times, Syndicate, places like that. And then when I was uh, 19 years old, a student at UCLA, I, um, I wrote a book called 357 Vigilante by Ian Ludlow. Ian for Ian Fleming, Ludlow for Robert Ludlow. So I'd be on the shelf right next to Robert Ludlow. <laughs> and so people would go, Ian Ludlow, you know, I think I read something by him. It wasn't bad. And my book, 357 Vigilante, came out the same week this guy Bernard Getz blew away some muggers on New York sub train, uh, subway train. My book became a huge bestseller. New World Pictures bought the movie rights and hired me to write the script. And I was 19. And I've been writing ever since, it, uh, with some male escorting yes. and international hey, espionage yes. on the side. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Um, were you into script writing ahead of writing the novel? Was that I something... love television. Okay. And I hadn't written a script before that book sold to the movies. But um, what was interesting is that book did well, but the other ones didn't. And my publishing career kind of died. And I went straight into TV, and I spent 25 years in the television business, writing and producing shows like Diagnosis Murder, Sequest, Sequest, yeah, Sequest, Talking Dolphin, Baywatch, um, Hunter, all kinds of shows. You've written episodes but in all those series. I have. You have not lived until you've written dialogue for a Talking Dolphin. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah, yeah. I was sitting there at the computer going, I'm writing for a dolphin. How did my life come to this? And then I worked on Baywatch, so having written for a dolphin really helped me get into David Hasselhoff's character on that show. Yes. Perfect. Um, and when you're writing TV, I'm a slight tangent really from novel writing, but it is fascinating to talk to somebody who writes TV episodes. Uh, how does this work? Do they say we've got an outline of an idea or do they expect you to come up with that? Well, it depends. Or? If you're a freelance writer, if you're not part of the show, you have to come in and pitch an idea for an episode. Okay. And then the showrunner will say whether they like it or not, or they'll say that's an interesting idea and, and go in a different direction with you in the room if they like it. Uh, but the stories for shows are developed in the writer's room. You know, with the executive producer and everybody else in the show involved. Because a script is not just a story, it's a blueprint for production. And a story has to be able to be shot in a way that the show can yes. uh, produce it, you know, for their budget so and on their shooting you schedule. You can't suddenly say, and then, and then they all went to North Korea. I'm sorry? You can't suddenly say, and then they all went to North Korea. In, in for a Baywatch episode, it has to fit within yes. what they can physically yes. film and what's possible. And yes. budget, I guess, when you're yeah. writing. I mean, you, you, you like, for instance, on Diagnosis Murder, each episode had to be shot in seven days. Three days on our standing sets, four days on location. We only had Dick Van Dyke for a certain number of hours on a certain number of days. We could only have a certain number of guest stars. We had a certain budget limitation. So all of our stories had to fit within those realities of production. And it takes a real skill to be able to tell a good story that can be shot for the budget and shooting schedule that you have. What do you find more satisfying, writing those episodes on TV or your Very novel? different. I mean, one of the joys of television is that you're in a room with a bunch of really clever writers, and it's very exciting. On the other hand, you have a lot of voices involved with the story you're telling. You also have networks and studios and actors and producers who are getting involved. With a novel, it's just you. No one gets in your way. It's, it's your pure creativity, but that can also be a little less satisfying and more lonely than being in a room with uh, 
bunch of other riders. And I suppose one uh, other benefit, unless you happen to sit opposite somebody on the subway who you notice is reading your book, which is now difficult because everyone's on Kindle, right. you do get to see the finished product. Yes, you, you do. But it sometimes it doesn't rep reflect at all what you wrote. Oh, okay. Um, because what you're writing is a document for other people to interpret. Right. So the story I have in my head is very different from the story that ends up on the page and very different from the story that's directed by the director and performed by the cast and shot by the cinematographer and also very different from the story that ends up after the editing process. So often what ends up on screen resembles what I originally had in mind but because so many other people got involved it can be better or worse or just different. But it must be quite cool to see big names, David Hasselhoff or oh, Dick, yeah, Dick Van Dyke. Oh, such a thrill to have David Hasselhoff it's, perform your oh, dialogue. No, come on. It's <laughs> saying, saying your words that you wrote. That must must be a nice moment. Yes and no. Oh, okay. Yes and no. <laughs> um, I, I, I still do get a thrill out of seeing my name on, on screen. I've, I have a TV series on uh, Hallmark right now called Mystery 101. And I don't produce it. Um, I don't write it. I created it. And it's fun to see my name on that. Yeah. Uh, do novelists, should novelists pay more attention to feature films yes. than, than at TV episodes? Well, no. I mean, both. Because okay. um, it's informing... It, it, it influences what readers expect from your storytelling. You've got to be as thrilling as what they're seeing on screen, if you're writing thrillers. Sure. Because you're competing with that. Are they going to spend 25 bucks for your book or 25 bucks to see a superhero throw a train at somebody? You've got to give them that same kind of bang for the buck. And Pacing, we haven't really talked about pacing, but film pacing is so critical to its success. And that, I would say that's probably the one area most frequently people get wrong in their books, the dragging no, every, bits. Or... Every book has its own pace. You just have to have a pace. You know, yeah. Once you establish that pace, you don't want to slow it down. You know, some people have a natural rhythm or a natural sense. I, I, I can't sing, I can't dance, but I do feel the rhythm of a story. And I can feel when it's slowing down, even when it's not books that I've written, I can feel the rhythm of the story and I can feel when the writer is out of step with it. And it's a, it's a skill. It's a, it's a, if it's a, whether you in, inherit or it's instinctive. Superb. Well, Lee, we're going to look out for your name in the credits now. Oh, thank you. Thank just, you. just before the director, isn't it? The writer comes Well, in the up. UK, you can see it on Diagnosis Murder every week. It's on every day. Every day. I love it. My daughter can go to school. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Okay, that was uh, Lee Goldberg wrapping up that segment on TV. So Lee talking about really useful tips and the most useful one I think you can take away, and I've been imparting it to people who've been speaking to me this week about trying to get into film and TV is, is do an adaptation. You do the adaptation. You have a screen, book, a screen uh, play because as John pointed out, when it's a novel, is a barrier to have that conversation. When it's already a screenplay, even if it's never gonna look like that, even if it's gonna be changed a million times before it becomes the actual film, you have the conversation because they know what a screenplay is, how it should work, they can see the beats, and they can see the potential of it. So even if you do it yourself, as a, a very rough uh, experiment in your own uh, trying something out, uh, get your screenplay written. Do you lie, lie awake at night envisaging your adaptations in the, on the big screen? Yeah, I find that often when I'm writing, I mean, I'm quite a big film and TV nut as it is, um, but quite often when I'm writing, I'm imagining how it would look as a piece of cinema anyway. So I yes. try to get the, like, you know, the, the style and the, uh, the imagery in there. Um, so yeah, I would, I would love to see my stuff on the screen. Well, that's, that brings us on to what Lee Goldberg was talking about, about using those techniques. And he said, you know, filmmaking is brutally commercial so much money time and effort goes into filming just a single scene of a film that the writing has to be spot on and so although we often you know we're all critics aren't we about films the way that the story unfolds in a film particularly a good film obviously is a real lesson for us in the way we should be unfolding stories in our novels yeah excellent man a few words but i like some enigma thomas Okay, we've got one bonus interview for you for Thriller Fest for the uh, round on, rounding off of this middle episode of our three. And this is the what sounds like the rather dry subject of legal issues. There was an absolutely fascinating pa uh, panel with a bunch of novel writing lawyers, many of whom had practiced criminal uh, work in courts here in the, uh, in the US. One guy was a defense attorney. He had, I can't remember how many cases he said he'd taken to the Supreme Court, but it was a lot. These guys really knew their legal stuff. And they gave a panel basically talking to novel writers about how to get it right. 
how not to make a fool of yourself when you're doing a police procedure when you're covering court cases. And again, these are general principles, not just pertaining to here in the States, which by the way, they revealed in the panel, every state's different. So anyway, it makes it very complicated. But if you're in the UK or France or Germany, you will need to be aware of the types of things that our guest here is talking about. Now he's Robert Dagoni. Uh, I think he began as a criminal lawyer, San Francisco, I want to say. And uh, he was an excellent, uh, excellent interviewee just to give us that, that insight on where it matters getting it right and how we should go about making sure that if we've got legal issues, procedures and our novels, we get that right. Here's, here's Robert. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. My name's Robert Dagoni, and I am a writer. I write police procedurals, and, and I, most recently an espionage thriller, and I'm, I'm a writer. You're a writer, a very successful writer, Thank and you. Uh, which has been great to see. Uh, police procedurals and espionage, but crucially, also, you were a lawyer, which I think is relevant to today. I was a lawyer. I practiced law in San Francisco for about 13, 14 years. Life gets it going. My wife wanted to move back to Seattle. I started practicing part-time there, but I was, I was always a writer. I mean, I, I had written before I ever went to law school. I wrote for the LA Times. So I really, I call myself a writer turn lawyer turn writer. So I've got a couple of questions. We're going to come on to the law, lawyer stuff at the beginning, but was there uh, any, were you getting any satisfaction from your legal career for your writing? Because there is a slightly artistic element to law, despite it being factual, you have to present and... Yeah, the, the, best, the best lawyers, I, I, I just was talking about, the best lawyers are the lawyers that are fearless. They go into a courtroom and it's a drama. I mean, a courtroom is a drama. And a good lawyer has to be a good actor because you're fear, you, know, you have all the anxiety and stress and everything weighing on you, but when you stand in a courtroom, you have to look like you're, everything's great. Everything's going fine. You know, no, nothing surprises you. And so you have to be a very good, uh, you have to be a very good actor. And a storyteller. And a storyteller. Uh, I once was told by a very uh, successful trial lawyer that the best trial lawyers are not the lawyers that tell the truth. They're the lawyers that tell the best story. Yeah, because whatever we like to believe about the, the facts and the figures of procedure, it's a jury at the end of the day. They're not legally trained, but stories, well, we're humans. Are, we are storytellers. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you get 12 people in a jury box and they're not trained. They come from all walks of life. They do all different sorts of things. And they're looking for the person that can tell the best story. But surprisingly, surprisingly, they're often able to weed through a lot of the nonsense and come up with the right decision. Good. Yeah. That's pleasing. Now, you've had a panel this morning where you've been talking about, uh, I think the emphasis really was on getting it right in, in books, which right. is a bit of a challenge, particularly for writers who don't have a legal background. Very much so. I mean, very much so. You, you know, law, is a, is a, it, there's a specialty there, and it's, it's, it's not something that necessarily comes naturally to a lot of people. A lot of the things that happen in a courtroom are not natural. There, you know, there's a lot of procedure involved, there's a lot of technicality involved, and as one of the people on the panel was talking about, it varies in every, every jurisdiction. So, you know, within a state, you can have five, six, seven different procedures that a lawyer has to be familiar with in order to get it right. I always say the best thing you can do is ask. When I get myself in trouble in a book, it's because I didn't ask. And even as a, as a lawyer or as a former lawyer, um, I have to ask because I'm not, I'm not on top of the legal system you know, right now because I'm not practicing right now. And it changes, it changes all, all the time. So you know, my advice is always to ask. If you don't know the answer, ask and get it right. Worth going to watch some court cases. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I've sat in on a lot of trials um, when I was writing a criminal procedure book, I went down to Seattle and I have a friend that's a, a, a prosecutor, state prosecutor, and I sit in the trial and I just watch what he's doing and why he's doing it. I don't bug him during the trial, sure. but then after the trial, I'll say to him, you know, why did, why did you do that? What, what, you know, what, what is it that you did? And, uh, and he'll explain it to me and he'll, he'll tell me what he did. He's been doing it for a long time and he's very successful at it. I thought there was an interesting question at the end of the uh, panel, which came from the audience, which was, when do you sacrifice reality for your story and vice versa? And there was an interesting set of answers, but you didn't speak on that. What's your take on that? 99% of the people that read your book are not going to know whether you ever did anything wrong. But as an artist, you always want to try to get it right. 
And I think, I think the best answer that was given is there's usually an answer that you can, you can get it right and just go a di at a different angle. So I just wrote a book to be coming out soon. And I was talking to my brother-in-law, who's a lawyer, and I ran him through this scenario and he said, you can't do that. And I looked at him, I said, what do you mean you can't do that? Well, there's this thing called the public duty doctrine. Well, explain it to me. He explained it to me. And once he explained it to me, I thought, you know, that's an even better story. Yeah. I can get around that and I can, make it, I can make it truthful. I can make it honest. So, you know, I think, I, I think that you don't ever want to look ridiculous. You know, you, the, the Perry Mason moments just don't happen anymore. People don't confess on a witness stand. So you want to get as accurate as possible. I think the bigger question is how much do you put in? I think that is really what can bore a reader and can get away from it is, is when you try to be too accurate because 99% of trials are boring. But if you can write that 1%, that 5%, what Elmar Leonard always used to talk about, write the parts that people are going to read, don't write the parts that people aren't going to read, then you can do a pretty good job. There's been an interesting surge recently of reality uh, legal. So we had Serial, the podcast, Making a Murderer, uh, The Staircase. I particularly enjoyed The Staircase on Netflix. I think that's, yeah. that's excellent which sort of shows that people actually are quite interested in some of those details. I mean, you still don't get to see the whole court case, and they still do the, what you've just described. They show you the, the bits you're going to remember. Um, but there is an appetite for some of that oh, nitty-gritty, isn't there? No, absolutely. I mean, I, I talked about that this morning. There is no greater drama. There is no greater drama. It, it, you know, I don't, I don't know other legal systems, but I would adventure around the world. There is no greater drama than when you have a person standing there with either their life on the line or their financial life on the line, right? And they're waiting for, for 12 people to make a decision about their life and what's gonna happen to their life. It's built in tension, it's built in drama, and it, it's fascinating for, for you know all of normal, no, not ordinary citizens, I, I should say, it's fascinating for ordinary citizens, citizens to watch this because as much as we think we know the legal system, we really don't. So there's, a, there's a, a, a fascination involved there, and then there's just drama. There's just really built-in drama. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mentioned on the way up here that I was a BBC reporter and covered quite a few court cases, and that's usually they were serious court cases. And that moment of the verdict, it catches your breath. There's Absolutely. A silence in the court, and, and you know in the next couple of seconds, lives are going to change, whatever, whatever the verdict is. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, that was the fascination of, of the O.J. Simpson trial. I mean, as much as a circus as that trial turned out to be, and it did turn out to be a circus, and that was really the judge's fault, um, as much as that was a circus, that moment when he stood, I mean, I was in a law firm at that time, and I was in a lunchroom, and we were all watching the television, and there was one African-American lawyer in that lunchroom. And when that verdict came down, I think he was the person who was the most disappointed because he realized what the ramifications of that were going to be, the backlash yeah. of what was going to happen. And it was, it was horrific. Um, so yeah, that, that moment is it's, fascinating. It's big. Um, one of the things I took from watching Making a Murderer and The Staircase in particular was um, the mistakes that get made by well-intentioned, hard-working defense lawyers in the very early stages that really tie people up in knots later down the line. And I thought that's a really good way of layering your character a bit. Having people, because it's easy to have your lawyer working hard but just not getting the breaks, but knowing afterwards that you could have done a bit more. Yeah. I thought that's a really interesting uh, thing you see in the reality of these court cases. Yeah, you know, one of the things that was mentioned on the panel this morning is, is you know, you have prosecutors that go into a courtroom and they feel like the defense attorney is not doing his or her job. And so you run that risk then of potentially having the whole case thrown out on appeal because the lawyer was incompetent. So what do you do? You know, and, and he was talking about, you know, he knows uh, prosecutors who have actually helped the defense lawyer in ways so that just so they don't, don't get the, the, uh, the case thrown out. Um, there's all different levels of lawyers here in the United States. And there's all different law schools that lawyers go through and there's people out there that are just trying to make a living and they might not be very good at what they do and, and I, you know it's no different than you know when you're sick and you go see a doctor yeah. and people say get a second opinion there's a reason for that 
You know, there's a reason for that. And, and lawyers are no different. There are good lawyers and there are not so good lawyers. And it came across in the panel, I think, some of the, uh, your colleagues on the panel hinting that it's been tough for them to deal with that, with going through these cases and the, the moral dilemma of defending somebody who they know is guilty, right. walking away from a trial thinking they could have done more for someone, and they've moved into other areas to get away from that. That also would make, I think, good, good layering and fiction. Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it may, it's the humanity of it. Um, and I, I, I did know lawyers who were absolutely fearless. I mean, I'd be sitting at a, a second chair at a, at a trial and we'd, we'd get a verdict against us. And it was, these were civil cases. And the lawyer would just turn to me and go, did the best we could. Yeah. You know, and I'm broken up inside. Yeah. You know, and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, we lost. But that's not, that wasn't the point. For, for a good, experienced lawyer, it was I did the best job I could and we lost. That's life. That's reality. Move on. There are some people built that way and there are some people that are not built that way. And it, it, I would think, I never tried a criminal case, but I would think for a criminal lawyer that would be very difficult. Maybe they cry at home. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Bob, let's just finish up on your writing now. So sure. you talked about your last book really being an espionage. It is. Book. So describe the difference then for you having moved from police procedural to espionage. So I really kind of had this, this story sort of fall, fall into my lap a little bit. And even though I didn't write the story that fell into my lap, um, I did have a character early on in my novels who was a former CIA agent who left. And I asked the individual, you know, would you help me with the espionage part of the book? And I really wanted to put it in a, in a country that was sexy, you know, something that was, would catch people's interest. And for the United States right now, you know, Russia is a very sexy country again because uh, of all the things going on and because of Putin and who he is and, and how he does things. And so I, have a, I, I set the story of a, a, of a guy that's brought back into the CIA for circumstances, you know, uh, related to his family. He's trying to take care of them. His business is failing. And so he goes back in to try to make some, some money. And everything is different than what was represented to him. And by the time he makes it back home, he finds himself being tried for espionage. Um, and the, part of that is a true story. Wow. Um, and, and that was sort of the fascination for me. So even though I didn't write this, didn't write this one particular gentleman's story, um, that drama that we talked about, about potentially facing prison for the rest of your life for something you did not do, and not only did you not do it, but you do not even have an agency that's standing up for you and is saying, you know, he, he didn't do it because of all the secrecy and stuff that has to be maintained and national secrets and national defense. It's pretty, pretty, um, pretty dramatic. I can see why you were drawn to the story. I want to know what happens now. Yeah. I hope there's some redemption. Yeah, I'm not no, going to say. No spoilers. <laughs> Bob, thank you so much indeed. It was a really interesting panel. And thank you for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. That was Bob Dagoni, and uh, he wraps away this episode. Do you, oh, you write sci-fi, so I guess you don't have a lot of criminal court cases. No, nobody ever goes to court in mine. There's no repercussions. Oh, I see. It's, a, it's, yeah. an, immor Legally. it's an immoral yeah. universe. Yeah, well, this, I think if, if you're jumping between time and space, it's quite difficult to have a police force. So that is a story in itself. Well, don't the stormtroopers ever come in and say, we're looking for two droids? And nah, it's like slight copyright infringement. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a legal issue. That would be a legal issue, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Okay, that's about it for this middle episode in the triptych of episodes from New York and Thriller Fest. But next week is a goodie, believe me, because again, regardless of the genre you write, we're going to talk to four of the biggest names who are here at Thriller Fest this year. We're going to talk to James Rollins, we're going to talk to James Grady, we're going to talk to John Sanford, we're going to talk to Harlan, Harlan Coburn. I can never say his name, Harlan Coburn. And listening to the, I mean, they've sold probably 100 million books plus between them, I'd imagine. I mean, certainly James Rollins, I can't remember if it's 20 or 30 million books he's sold. Uh, he does say it in the interview. Uh, but, but what a surprise when we get to the interviews. Down to earth, just basically putting the work in, learning how to write, learning what works, listening to others, reading others, all the things we kind of know that goes into the pot, the ingredients that make a good writer. But it's great to hear it and inspirational to hear from those four guys. So uh, really looking forward to that final episode next week. The enigma that is Ashford and Blatch will be back from Dumbo under the Brooklyn Bridge. Join us for our final episode. In the meantime, I hope you have a fantastic week writing and a great week selling your books.
Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show. <laughs>